Hi, I'm Mary Groth on the staff of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. My title is Director of Member and Donor Engagement, and I'm very happy today to have this conversation with old friend Warren Rossman. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I am now of counsel with Weston Heard. Warren was one of many um, volunteers who stepped up and answered our call for Legacy 150 authors for the Bar Journal. So in 2023, in each issue of the journal, January through December, we're going to have featured articles about the legacy of the Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, and Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Associations in honor of our 150th birthday. So Warren, really appreciate that you uh, stepped up to volunteer. Um, and uh, could you just give me a little sense of what appealed to you about our volunteer request in this project? One of my hobbies is, uh, is that I read a lot of history books, not only history books, but a lot of history books. I enjoy writing also. Uh, and so this seemed like a, a good way, particularly when you mentioned uh, Sherlock Andrews, to combine the two, to combine the writing and my love of history, uh, which I've always had. I mean, even when I was a little kid, when I was uh, seven, I would gravitate towards uh, not so much history books, but encyclopedias and history articles and mm -hmm. encyclopedias, that kind of thing. See, in that respect, we're kindred spirits because, and as we've talked about during this during this project, um, my love of history is huge. I actually have a history degree and love everything about it, always have. It was my favorite subject in, in school growing up. And like you, I would read anything historical, even encyclopedias, looking up new knowledge and looking up things. So Warren, why don't you share a little bit about how you um, came to the practice of law and uh, your career at Weston Heard? I certainly wasn't one of those kids who said, I want to be an attorney. Uh, uh, that was not me. In fact, I, uh, when I was growing up, I, I used to say, I want to be anything but an attorney. And I had thought of going into history, uh, but uh, in, by my senior year of college, I really started seriously thinking about what am I going to do for my future? And uh, there was uh, quite a bit of parental pressure. Uh, they were uh, suggesting that I should go to law school. And I also, because I was at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, um, which has a, a fine history department, was able to, uh, I was in contact with a lot of history grad students, and I was hearing uh, their complaints. And uh, the the major complaint was that they couldn't find jobs, mm -hmm. or if they, or if there was a job opening, there were like 400 applicants for for one opening. Mm -hmm. Knowing that I sort of wanted to go into the social sciences, I, on my own, uh, but with some parental pushing, uh, decided to go to law school, uh, and I went to Case. While I was at Case, I really liked my torts class. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that sort of meant litigation. Um, I didn't think of myself as a trial attorney. Besides torts, I really liked uh, the research and writing. Mm -hmm. So when I got out, I um, applied to uh, multiple, for multiple clerkships uh, became a clerk, a uh, law clerk at Common Pleas Court for two judges, Anne McNaneman and Bob Lother. I uh, did the same thing for both judges, wrote memos concerning motions. Uh, if they needed an opinion, I would write the first draft. I had a lot more contact with Anne McNaneman. It was just the way she worked. And uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, we would... Uh, have a half hour or 45 minutes almost every day. Um, maybe not Fridays, but uh, other days we mm -hmm. did, uh, where we would talk about motions, uh, talk about cases, talk about uh, strategy, possible strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was fun. So that's what sort of aimed me to Weston Heard and litigation. And what was really weird for me is that, I again, I didn't think of myself as a trial attorney. And what happened at Weston Heard was that after about my 
first two years, and the first two years were basically writing briefs, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. I started to get small cases. And those small cases, um, some of them needed to go to trial. And uh, so I started getting some trial experience. And it was something that, uh, again, I never thought I would do, but I, I ended up getting quite a what now would be quite a bit of trial experience. You know, one thing about your firm, Weston Heard, um, and I remember, did you start when it was in the Terminal Tower? Yes, and about my second or third year, Lou Paisley was the bar president, and maybe about my seventh year or eighth year, Mark O'Neill was the bar president. Mm -hmm. And these two guys were the the giants of the litigation section of that firm. Mm -hmm. They were very interesting people, very gentlemanly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, no yelling. These were not yeller type people. For some reason, they were not the best of friends. They were at opposite ends of the same floor. Um, and the interesting thing is I only saw them together once, and it was to chew me out uh, for <laughs> something I did wrong, uh, for uh, basically for getting a, a coverage opinion for about six months. In their own different ways, they were sort of si very similar. Lou Paisley did uh, products liability. Mm -hmm. Mark O'Neill did basically everything other than products liability. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to know both gentlemen. Uh, and Weston Heard really is kind of a cradle of presidents because um, Mr. Weston was a president of the bar. David Arnold was a president at uh, of the county bar. Um, when, um, and then we also had Tim Johnson when he was at Weston Heard. Tim was also uh, our bar president. So when you think about Ohio being the cradle of presidents, Weston Heard produced quite a few of our bar presidents over the years. We've had five bar presidents. Mm -hmm. Burns Weston had already retired by the time I got to Weston Heard, but he uh, would appear about once a year and wanted to talk to the young associates. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a summer place in the Adirondacks, which is where he was from. Mm -hmm. um, and we, my wife and I went to visit him once uh, a couple years before he died. And uh, it's a beautiful home on a sort of a ridge side. Mm -hmm. There is a Mount Weston in the Adirondacks, wow. and there is a Weston, uh, Burns Weston Trail. Yeah, he was very influential. I did a little research. Um, he worked in the FDR cabinet. Um, you know, his career was one that encompassed a lot of different activity, not just the practice of law, but a very inspiring leader. Um, and it and, um, looks like he had an impact on you as well. I, I think on the whole firm. Uh, mm -hmm. um, at that time, we, the firm was... About two-thirds of the firm was doing a litigation practice and uh, uh, an insurance defense practice, and that basically came from him. Mm -hmm. well, I know you're a transplanted Eastsider. Tell us a little bit about that, the move from uh, East to West and, and uh, how that went and how you enjoy the West Side. I grew up uh, in University Heights, and so I went to Cleveland Heights High School mm -hmm. because it's a combined school district. Lived on the east side when I was a law clerk in Richmond Heights. But when I got married in 1990, I moved in with my wife, who had an apartment at the Chesterfield mm -hmm. uh, on uh, Chester and 18th, I think, yeah. or Chester and 12th. Playhouse Square, yeah. 12th, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, so we lived there for four years, and then we decided to get a house. And at that time, they had the residency requirement. My wife is an attorney with the uh, city law department. Mm -hmm. So we looked for a house in Cleveland, and uh, we found a, a neat little uh, Cape Codder uh, on Edgewater. Uh -huh. uh, and that's where we've lived for the last, uh, I think, 28 years. So I've been a West Sider for 28. I've actually been a West Sider for almost as long as I've been on the East Side, but it's, it feels like I'm still ex uh, finding my way on the on the west side. That's a, it's a monumental move for those of us who grew up in this area. I'm I'm a west sider by birth, and when I travel to the east side, I always feel like I'm not sure where I am. <laughs> I I joke. I, I don't know how politically correct this is that I am bicidal. So <laughs> I like that. I like that. And I know that you've done a lot of different volunteer projects here at the Bar Association. What, can you talk a little bit about those different projects? I know you were bar admissions. Uh, chair, which is a huge volunteer project. So talk a little bit about what you've done as a bar member. I 
did a lot of work uh, with the uh, law school liaison committee. I don't know if it still exists. Yeah, um, we do. We have something like that okay. with our, in our workforce development programs, yes. Through that, I, was, uh, I spoke at CASE uh, two or three times about various subjects. And so the idea was to have a job fair where law firms would have uh, seats and they could, I don't know about handing out pamphlets, but they could talk to law students that were looking for a job mm -hmm. or thinking about looking for a job. Uh, and we did that for, I would say, four or five years. Mm -hmm. That was the first big project I was involved with. And that sort of segued into something else, which was a, a job seekers group. That became something where I had a meeting uh, at my law firm, uh, but it was advertised in the, um, in the bar journal every month mm -hmm. for bar members that were looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and we would talk about strategies. We would talk about interview techniques. Um, we would talk about what kind of jobs to look for. Mm -hmm. and, and that went on for about three, four years. Mm -hmm. So giving back to uh, lawyers coming up and, and into the profession is something that you feel very strongly about as a volunteer. Yes, yeah. yes. Another sort of project that isn't in the traditional you know, committee or section thing uh, is the film program that we did that for about three years. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was was to get people to come here so that they could experience the auditorium. Right, right. And by that time, um, uh, DVDs were out, so we could easily get movies. We showed things like um, My Cousin Vinny, um, A Few Good Men, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, um, Movies with, you know, some kind of lawyer connection. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we never got to show 12 Angry Men. And, and I always joke that I would have liked to have shown both the American 12 Angry Men that everybody's familiar with mm -hmm. and the Russian version that nobody is familiar with or few people are familiar, familiar with because that's a great movie and it's different. Uh-huh. You're a real film buff. <laughs> and in fact, if you're lucky enough to be on his distribution list, he sends emails with recommendations and, and film reviews to, to us. And it's something that I look forward to because they're always really thoughtfully done. And uh, do you have, when you think about it, do you have a favorite lawyer movie? Probably A Few Good Men, just because of the that final scene with, with Jack uh, Nicholson. Right. Uh I mean, you can't get much more dramatic than that. Uh, other than the legal movies, what's your favorite movie of all time that you've that you've seen? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I, lo I love seeing Holiday Inn, uh, which is the movie that introduced uh, the the song White Christmas, and all of the songs are Irving Berlin songs, mm -hmm. and it it's got some great dancing with uh, Fred Astaire. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's just a wonderful movie. Uh, um, I saw the movie North by Northwest when I was eight years old. It's one of my favorites. At Radio City <laughs> Music Center in New York. We were, family was on a vacation uh -huh. there. And a little bit of the movie was over my head, but I, I understood enough of it. Um, and so that's always been a favorite. Um, I saw today that the movie Charade was placed on the National Register of Yep, another of Cary Grant movie. Uh -huh. And that's always been a favorite. I saw that at my junior high auditorium uh, maybe a year after it came out. So uh, we're going to move into talking about our Legacy 150. So you were the, f the first article that's coming out in January is about the founding of our uh, bar in 1873, and specifically focused on our first bar president, Sherlock J. Andrews. Why don't you talk a little bit about Sherlock Andrews, your research, and, and what you learned about him in, in the course of, of preparing that article for the, for the bar. I, I would say I look at him almost as a George Washington-type figure. His, uh, his career here in the 1800s was unparalleled. 
Well, it really was. And it, I, I think the situation was something where the, the more I found out about the guy, the more I wanted to find out more about the, mm-hmm. the, the person because he really uh, did everything. He came here when there were about either 600 or 1,000 people in Cleveland. I mean, it was a very small burg. And by the time he died in 1880, um, Cleveland was something like the 15th largest city in the country. So the city had this phenomenal growth. Mm -hmm. And he was involved in many of the major institutions. He was involved in founding many of the major institutions that grew up with the city. Um, He was the first city council president. He uh, had a very active role in uh, founding uh, Trinity Church, which is now Trinity Cathedral. He was the one of the first presidents of the Society for Savings. When I was in elementary school, uh, we all had little bank accounts with mm-hmm. Society for Savings, mm-hmm. which became Society Bank, which became Key Bank. Mm-hmm. He was a congressman for a term. Uh, and in that, I found it very similar to Lincoln because Lincoln was a, a, mm-hmm. a, a congressman for one term uh, about eight years later, but and they were both Whigs. When I found that out, I had a feeling that at some point he uh, morphed from being a Whig uh, into a Republican, and sure enough, he did. Once I found that out, I figured out that he probably had something to do when Lincoln visited Cleveland um, on Lincoln's trip from Springfield to Washington to assume the presidency. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, uh, when I was able to find the Plain Dealer articles, uh, Sherlock uh, Andrews not only uh, took part in that, but actually was the person who introduced Uh, Lincoln to the audience at the Weddell House. Which is now where the um, Rockefeller Rockefeller building building is. In fact, there's a monument uh, on the building. That that you found, yes. Yes. Uh Interestingly, too, he had connection to Stephen Douglas. I was looking at a lot of books, seeing what I could find, and one of them said was was talking about how Stephen Douglas read law under under Sherlock Andrews. You, You wonder if Lincoln and Andrews, if they spoke at all, Mm -hmm. uh, and if they did, whether they spoke about Stephen Douglas. Yeah, it's interesting to speculate. Uh, You know, he was incredible. We also saw that he was the founder of what is today Beachbrook. It was the uh, county orphanage, the first county orphanage. Um, And then he ends up becoming the Cleveland Bar Association's first president when the Bar Association was founded in 1873. And setting that, you, you set a great, you put the context in your article. You know, in 1873, our president was Ulysses S. Grant. It was post-Civil War, Reconstruction, then moving into um, kind of the Gilded Age uh, and, and a lot of the challenges in, in the post-Civil War era, a lot of change. So our city grew kind of from the frontier out, outlands to, as you said, a, an industrial and commercial center pretty quickly in the 1800s. He, he was here for that arc and then became the first president of the association. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, this, the founding of the association in 1873 and, and why they did what they did? It, it's sort of a, a, the chicken and the egg thing. It's sort of interesting, and I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that in a second. So at that first meeting, the purpose was twofold. One, to establish the organization. Two, was to force a federal judge, and this this is General Sherman's older brother, uh, who was the federal judge, to try to force that federal judge to resign. On the substantive side, the one thing they did was uh, make a resolution to mm-hmm. ask this judge to resign. The other thing they did that day in March of 1873 was to start the bar organization. Mm-hmm. So to me, the, the chicken versus the egg thing is, did they do this solely because of the judge, 
or were they already going to start the organization? Right. And this just became their first sort of cause. I, I don't know. I couldn't. Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell when you look at the history. One thing that's for sure is we were one of the first bar associations in the country, um, and we preceded both the American Bar and the Ohio State Bar. In fact, we're involved with the other metropolitan bars in Ohio in, in setting up kind of uh, the state bar. So bar associations at that time were starting to form. I know in the documents that we found, and there's um, the the initial record book with the handwritten yes. signatures and the handwritten minutes are at the Western Reserve Historical Society. They set up some committees when they first started, and one was an investigation committee, similar to the grievance committee that we have today. They had a membership committee. They had a, a, a committee... Um, I think on grievances as opposed to to the investigation committee, and they also did um, judicial. Uh, very early on, they were involved in judicial um, elections, um, re- reviewing and making recommendations about judicial uh, candidates was something that the bar did in its very very early years, um, and that's continued to today. You know, from a city that had kind of when he got here less than ten attorneys, right, and a very small population. A city that expanded, you know, very quickly with a lot of lawyers. Fifty-three lawyers started the bar association in 1873. The the growth of the practice of law with the growth of the city, you know, uh, w- was something that certainly contributed to wanting to organize a bar, have a place where where there could be those efforts. He was president for seven years, um, so we had a seven-year president. I think the the first one and only one that had that length of of tenure. You've documented too, kind of how he lived in the downtown, our current downtown footpath. His houses were, you know, it's very interesting. Yeah. He started out with his wife around West Ninth Street. Mm-hmm. The the streets had different names. the the uh, The numbered, what are the numbered streets now, mm-hmm. had different names then. The Euclid, Superior, Saint Clair. They were always they always had those right. names. Um, so he started out around West Ninth, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's right near the river. Right. I mean, that's that's where the city was yep, back that's, in that's where the 1823. Commerce or, started, right? Right, yeah, yep. exactly. Mm-hmm. Then he moved to Public Square, uh, a little bit down from uh, Old Stone Church. Then he moved to across from the Opera House. And I know that the Opera House was on East 4th Street. Mm-hmm. So that's why I wrote in mm-hmm. the article that he lived around Euclid in East Forest Street. When he died, he lived on Euclid near what what is today East 55th Street. Mm-hmm. And he is buried at Lake View Cemetery. Yeah. He's an interesting, very interesting person. And, and it makes me think, I mean, I think about the years of, in, in offices gone by, his portrait hung in the old Cleveland Bar offices, and I always looked at him and wondered, you know, who, who is, really, what's the story behind Sherlock Andrews? His story is fascinating. I mean, it just, his his life, he was involved in anti-slavery, abolition um, activities, uh, he, his litigation experience in the 1800s here, you know, was involved in some really big legal uh, matters, and then ends up as president of, of the Bar Association. And, and one of the things that struck me was um, how he set uh, a very high bar for presidents to come after him. His legacy really does shine a light on on a somebody that had, you know, a foot in, in law and a foot in the community and really represented the best attributes of, of a bar leader. You know, if we had Sherlock Andrews here today and you, somebody could ask him, uh, you know, what did you do that was that you feel is really important? I think he would answer his his anti-slavery position and obviously the abolitionist positions that he took from very early on. Northeastern Ohio was a hotbed of abolitionism. Mm-hmm. You know, this is was one of the terminals of the Underground Railroad. Mm-hmm. Andrews is active in anti-slavery movement in Congress. He uh, started the Cleveland Anti-Slavery Committee. Uh, his whole life is spent backing abolitionist anti-slavery politics. Well, we really appreciate, uh, Warren, your wealth of knowledge and sharing that with us. And I hope everybody reads the article. I think it's a wonderful piece. So well, thank, thank you, you, Warren. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.